Good afternoon all. Being in Montreal, it is now official that in December this year, 2022, the second part of the 15th Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity will happen in this city of Montreal after postponing it for over four times. Conference of the Parties 15 will be a crucial event where 196 member states to the convention will have the responsibility of adopting an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework to achieve a common vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. We need this for our own good. In the last issue of its global risk report, the World Economic Forum ranked biodiversity loss as one in three top risks facing our society, along with climate change and extreme weather. With much of our economy being dependent on resources provided by nature, nature loss is threatening the way of life. $44 trillion of yearly economic value generation, half of the global GDP relies on services provided by nature. In a timely statement on 28th June at the G7 summit in, in Elmau, Germany, the ministers of finance of G7 countries recognize the agents in their joint community, which underlines the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation on peace, stability, and security, and committing to work together with the global community to counter those impacts. Nature and climate are closely interlinked. The changing climate increases pressures on nature, at the same time, nature-based solutions are an important means of reaching net zero commitments and adapting to climate change. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBS, nature-based solutions have the potential to provide 37% of climate change mitigation until 2030 needed to meet the goal of keeping climate warming below two degrees centigrade with the likely core benefits for biodiversity. Businesses and financial organizations can play a critical role in favor of nature. Corporate value chains, financial flows, asset portfolios still re largely rely on and incentivize activities that cause adverse impacts on nature. The financial needs to support, the financial sector needs to support nature conservation and restoration, which are largely unmet. Businesses and financial organizations can have a decisive influence by aligning financial flows with objectives to reduce pressures on nature and to support activities that protect and restore nature. Aligning of financial resources from both public and private sources is an important goal stated within the draft post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. I have the honor of co-chairing the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, or TNFD, whose mission is to deliver a global framework for reporting on nature-based, nature-related risks, impacts, and opportunities and catalyze a shift in financial flows from nature negative to nature positive outcomes. This mission is aligned with the draft global biodiversity framework, especially target 15, which calls for mandatory disclosure by businesses and financial institutions on their exposure to nature related risks and impacts.
The Global Biodiversity Framework also strongly incorporates the urgency of shifting financial flows from activities that impact nature to activities that protect and restore nature. This is reflected in draft target 14 on the integration of biodiversity within policies and regulations, as well as draft target 18 on the repurposing and redirecting of harmful subsidies, and draft target 19 on increasing financial flows for biodiversity from all sources. The task force on nature-related financial disclosure is led by senior executives from leading corporate and financial institutions and supported by a forum of over 500 organizations from businesses and civil societies. It is funded by governments and multilateral organizations already endorsed by G7 and G20 countries. Various businesses and initiatives, such as the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, are partnering with the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure to promote improved measurements of and reporting on nature-related risks and impacts for their businesses. To ensure consistency and facilitate adoption and implementation, adoption and implementation by the market, the TNFD works with other reporting standards, such as the International Sustainability Standards Board, which I'm pleased to see headquartered here in Montreal. Other partners include the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, also the Global Reporting Initiative, the Carbon Disclosure Project, and the Science-Based Targets for Nature. The TNFD framework is already released in draft form or better version with our latest revision released just last week or 28th June. I encourage the business organizations here to review it and share comments with us and wherever possible, test this draft framework. The task force has already worked hard to propose a simple yet practical guidance for analyzing and reporting upon nature-related risks, impacts, and opportunities for corporates and financial organizations. Building on lessons learned from the market organizations will greatly strengthen our initiative. And the next iteration of the TNFD framework incorporating feedback from market organizations will be released in early November this year. And again, another version in February next year, which will allow the framework to reflect the outcomes of the COP of the CBD to be held in December here in Montreal, and therefore to secure that alignment of the TNFD with the goals and targets of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak these few words, and I wish you constructive discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Vrema, for this insightful introduction, and welcome to everybody. Um, I'm pleased to be uh, seated here with very distinguished panelists uh, that you uh, know déjà. So uh, je vais je vais les laisser se présenter uh, elles-mêmes, en fait, parce qu'on est presque un, un panel. Uh, presque exclusivement féminin, bien que M. Rodolfo euh, Lassi qui soit avec nous euh, virtuellement euh, cet après-midi. Donc, euh, un petit tour de table pour euh, nous expliquer un petit peu comment, euh, how, how your, your institution kind of fits in the uh, disclosure landscape and what role uh, you play in there. Let's start maybe uh, with, uh, with you, Moira. <laughs> sure. I'm Moira Gill. I head up Environment, Government and Industry Relations for TD Insurance. And maybe a word or two about why climate change risk and therefore climate change risk disclosure is so important for the insurance industry. We are living with the impact of climate change happening right now. So everyone will know about the forest fires in Linton, BC, the floods in BC, <laughs> um, Fort McMurray, 
um, we are getting one in a hundred year events happening several times in a decade. And so from an operational perspective, we have to um, accommodate, um, address these risks right now in our operations and find a way to help both our business and our customers be more resilient. So with reference to the comments at the beginning about biodiversity and nature, this resilience is often focused on nature-based solutions. So protecting, developing, um, rehabilitating wetlands, for example, so that when we do have floods, there is a natural infrastructure that helps absorb that. So since all these risks are present right now in how we operate today, we really have to find a way to understand these risks and then quantify and explain them to our stakeholders, be they the customers who we need to help become more resilient and also our regulators and shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so forth. Thank you. Bonjour, Madame Labrie. C'est un plaisir de vous avoir avec nous euh, aujourd'hui. Euh, Madame Labrie de Cogeco, pouvez-vous nous présenter un peu euh, euh, votre entreprise puis votre rôle à l'intérieur de celle-ci? Euh, bonjour. Alors, ça me fait plaisir d'être ici avec vous euh, aujourd'hui. Cogeco est un leader nord-américain dans le secteur des télécommunications et des médias. Donc, on fournit des services Internet, vidéo, euh, téléphonie et nous avons aussi des stations de radio. Euh, donc, nous sommes une entreprise cotée en bourse euh, et euh, donc, euh, moi, mon rôle euh, au sein de Cogeco, euh, c'est de, de, de m'occuper en fait des services euh, de tout ce qui est affaires publiques, communication et dans le cadre de mon port portefeuille, j'ai aussi le volet EG. Cogeco a lancé son programme EG qu'on appelait euh, au début Resp Responsabilité sociale d'entreprise, RSE, euh, il y a 12 ans. Euh, nous avons intégré les secteurs environnementaux euh, il y a environ euh, 10 ans et euh, nous avons aussi établi notre première cible de réduction euh, d'émissions en 2015. Euh, donc, euh, en tant qu'entreprise dans un secteur où aussi on joue un rôle pour faciliter la transition et atteindre les cibles euh, net zéro, euh, parce que dans le fond, avec l'Internet, on peut réduire le besoin de transport. Euh, donc, on, on, on joue un rôle important euh, et on euh, met euh, donc à travers tout ça, on a pris des engagements fermes. We were the first telecommunication company in Canada to have its uh, emission reduction targets uh, approved by Science-Based Target Initiative. Last year, we were very proud of this, and uh, so we're um, very committed, and we have a plan in place to achieve also net zero by 2050. Merci. Uh, going to you, Mr. Uh, Lassie, uh, happy to have us with you. Uh, um, from, from industry to company to maybe OECD now, which is a broader picture, but uh, it will give us a wider perspective. Can you tell us how the OECD has played a role thus far in, in the reporting landscape and making sure that this information is, is uh, that climate risks, but also opportunities are, are uh, divulged and, uh, and shared with all the stakeholders? Well, thank you very much, uh, Sophie, for this uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the International uh, Economic Forum of the Americas for inviting us to this important conference. Uh, there is a great expectation on how to transition to net zero the scenarios, taking into account uh, the world implications of the unjust uh, war against Ukraine and the complex economic recovery uh, from the different waves of the uh, never-ending COVID pandemic. For the OECD, uh, 38 uh, developed countries, investment in the green economy needs to take place uh, on a far greater scale um, over coming years, but especially this decade, uh, if we are, of course, to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the 1.5 degrees uh, target uh, of the Paris Agreement, and all these uh, biodiversity new uh, post-2020 uh, uh, targets that will be defined in Montreal, uh, jointly with, of course, uh, the, the China uh, presidency of the COP15. But six years ago, the OECD took a major step uh, to support these objectives uh, by establishing a center on green finance and investment. The center missions is to help catalyze the, and support 
uh, the transition to a green, net zero and climate resilient economy through the development of effective policies, because we are an international governmental uh, organization, uh, institutions, we need institutions and instruments for sustainable finance and investment. In order to do that, um, every year we organize uh, an international forum. Last year, uh, the topic was related with ESG practices, and, and this year we are calling for the financial uh, community to have a deeper dialogue on transition finance. Transition finance, in our opinion, is, is quite important right now, now that we are tra transitioning to something that uh, we never experienced, you no know, zero emissions. Well, that's a, uh, I am an environmental engineer, so for me it's like a dream, you no? Know? Uh, so transition finance uh, uh, is important. We will be launching during the forum in October uh, our new transition finance guidelines, and we will have a specific uh, plenary session on how to, of course, uh, reinforce the ESG investing uh, uh, criteria. We recently published two important reports related with the ESG ratings and, and climate transition, assessing the alignment of uh, the E pillar uh, scores and metrics. You know that there are a great variety of, uh, of approaches, uh, uh, different, uh, of course, uh, uh, indicators um, and data that our companies and, and our countries are, are managing. We have been tracking more than uh, 12 sustainable finance uh, taxonomies, guidance and principles developed by both the public and private sector, as well as, as more than uh, 40 financial instruments. In fact, we are tracking more than uh, 3,600 different economic instruments because we are the custodians of, of that information from our OECD countries. So it is clear that ESG ratings have become a leading forum of sustainable finance and have progressed uh, from early stages uh, uh, development uh, five years ago to mainstream finance in the monitor of OECD uh, jurisdictions. So that's why we, uh, in recent years, are deeply involved and, and we really uh, are happy to be here. Uh, of course, we invite you to our uh, forums, but also to read our reports and documents. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Lassi. Euh, je me tourne vers, euh, maintenant vers Geneviève Morin de Fonds d'Action qui, justement, euh, doit démêler tous les systèmes euh, auxquels M. Lassie faisait référence. Euh, Pouvez-vous nous expliquer un peu euh, comment Fonds d'Action euh, se situe dans ce, ce, ce paysage? Un fonds d'action, c'est un fonds d'investissement qui est axé sur le développement durable depuis euh, son démarrage, donc euh, il, y a, il y a un peu plus de 26 ans. Euh, on, on fait ça parce que notre capital provient de l'épargne retraite d'à peu près 200 000 actionnaires hein, qui ensemble ont, re, ont regroupé 3 milliards puis qui cherchent à s'assurer que cet argent-là serve à construire un meilleur avenir pour eux-mêmes, mais aussi pour l'ensemble de la société. Alors, euh, ben, d'abord, Fondation, on produit nous-mêmes des rapports de développement durable sur notre propre activité. On produit également euh, la mesure de l'empreinte carbone de notre portefeuille. Mais surtout, on utilise toutes ces données extra-financières-là dans nos décisions d'investissement. Donc, quand on investit auprès d'entreprises, de fonds, projets qui, euh, qui visent à, à générer des impacts au Québec, on cherche d'abord à s'assurer au niveau gestion de risque, hein, qu'on n'investit pas dans des pollueurs ou des, des mauvais citoyens corporatifs. Mais ça, c'est ça devient rapidement insuffisant. Donc, on a ajouté à ça la, la recherche de retombées positives. Qui est vraiment en train de transformer l'économie pour la rendre plus équitable, verte, inclusive et en, enfin, on s'est rendu jusqu'à justement cibler certaines retombées en particulier et créer une équipe d'impact, donc d'investissement d'impact avec des intentions partagées entre l'entreprise et le fonds et des mesures aussi des résultats et des retombées de l'activité d'investissement. Donc, je peux dire, pourrais revenir un peu plus tard là, sur comment on, on fait ça plus ça clairement avec les PME. C'est un sujet de grand intérêt. Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame Morin. Let's turn to you, uh, Bridget. Thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, um, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that the people in this room have an evil levels of, uh, of understanding of, of VSG disclosure and specifically environmental reporting. And um, 
Uh, and it, for many, it sometimes comes across as an alphabet soup of acronyms and organizations. So um, there, is, there is a basic but very fundamental question is, why, why is it important to report on environmental impacts and how does this drive decision making? Well, potentially to start off, speaking of that alphabet soup, I might very briefly introduce what CDP, another one of those alphabets are. <laughs> um, CDP was referenced in the opening remarks um, by our previous name, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. It was started in 2002. And it was at that time kind of the first systemic link between environmental information and financial information. Um, since then, we have grown and expanded quite significantly. Um, that's part of the reason we're no longer called the Carbon Disclosure Project because we have expanded beyond carbon. Um, and we now also operate in uh, water security and deforestation. We have a new strategy and plan at CDP. We're actually going to be expanding further into all planetary boundaries to recognize this importance of nature. But we now operate um, the world's largest environmental disclosure system that is enabling companies, cities, states, and regions to disclose, and by doing so, measure and be able to start to manage. I think that the two of you did a great job already kind of indicating why transparency and having that data available is necessary to actually move towards making those decisions. But through operating that system, we now do have um, the most comprehensive and comparable as well as TCFD, so the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD aligned um, data set of environmental information. Um, we, that in Talking about why that information is important, I can kind of simultaneously indicate where CDP sits there. So our, our theory of change is that if we, we utilize our, our model of utilizing the authorities, so investors and other capital markets actors requesting this disclosure and this transparency from organizations, we get that information. That information goes in multiple directions. So having a, um, as I said, a comprehensive and comparable data set that we can use to benchmark and track progress towards a um, 1.5C, a net zero nature positive world. Um, that benchmarking is important at a global level. It's important for the users of that information. It's also important for the disclosures themselves. So the companies or the cities looking at where they are in that progress and receiving feedback of how to push for Forward through there. So that information flows in multiple directions as well as to uh, policymakers and governments. Our disclosure platform shows that um, capital is ready to move. This is a feasible, this is feasible and it provides then that kind of push for uh, regulators and governments to increase the ambition of um, standards that are going out there and moving into the mandatory kind of disclosure space. And it also informs many of the kind of ESG research um, ratings. But the true, I think, value for the companies themselves is, and as well as the other disclosures that disclose through our system, is that it's very much kind of a strategic illumination um, planning and preparedness tool. So there are a variety of benefits um, kind of ranging from brand value, so brand reputation, um, competitive advantage, um, to kind of risk management and uncovering opportunities as well as tracking progress, as I mentioned. But I think one of the most important in terms of that planning and preparedness tool, you can't plan for things you don't know about. And there is a ton of, there's a black box of risk and opportunities, particularly when we start kind of moving, uh, moving outside of the carbon and the climate space and looking into nature. Um, and then on the preparedness side, kind of if you are, if you have been disclosing through something like CDP or any other standard, you're very well prepared for regulations that we are seeing now and are coming down the line. Um, so maybe that is enough to kind of start the conversation. Yes, there. no, it really sets the table really well. I love that you said that capital is ready to move, which <laughs> which is a really good segue into uh, pursuing the conversation. We started with uh, Geneviève Morin, donc sur, sur cette uh, sur cette lancée, um, vous avez commencé à parler comment vous utilisez cette information là, mais vous faites plus que l'utiliser en fait là, vous, uh, vous 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 incitez vos entreprises en portefeuille et vous recherchez activement des entreprises qui 
agissent sur l'environnement sur euh, et qui ont un impact positif. Est-ce que vous pouvez euh, peut-être euh, élaborer sur ce que vous aviez entrepris euh, il, y a, il y a quelques ouais. instants? Alors, les premières étapes, quand on regarde le, le, le filtre un peu de nos investissements, la première étape, c'est qu'il y a des normes d'exclusion des seuils de performance. Donc, on va exclure certains secteurs, comme par exemple, on a exclu le pétrole chez nous depuis 2009, puis les, les, les carburants fossiles. Puis ensuite, on va avoir des seuils minimaux de performance. Si une entreprise, par exemple, a trop de problèmes en santé et sécurité, on n'investira pas. Donc, ça, ça va nous permettre un certain niveau de gestion de risque. Mais ce qui est intéressant, c'est quand on, on tombe dans l'autre étape, on fait un diagnostic de performance globale. Et là, c'est une belle occasion de découvrir comment les PME ne sont pas toujours bien équipées pour avoir cette information-là, comment il faut la chercher. On doit faire questionnaire, entrevue, rencontre, visite sur place pour réussir à rassembler l'information. Mais ça nous permet de dresser vraiment le bilan des risques et des opportunités au niveau extra-financier pour l'entreprise. Et ça lui donne un premier, un premier bulletin pour se situer et voir qu'est-ce qu'ils veulent améliorer. Pour rejoindre ce que Brigitte mentionnait tantôt, là, quand on ne le sait même pas, hein, on ne peut pas travailler dessus, on a comme un risque. Alors, nous, ça leur permet de découvrir ça. Et ensuite, la troisième étape, c'est qu'on mesure dans les produits et services qu est -ce qui est de, quelles, quelles sont les contributions aux objectifs de développement durable pour vraiment aller cibler les entreprises qui œuvrent à, à transformer l'économie. Donc, pas nécessairement des entreprises qui cherchent à améliorer leurs propres pratiques, mais des entreprises qui fabriquent les, les, les machines ou tout qui vont permettre aux autres d'améliorer la gestion de l'eau ou la gestion ou les émissions de carbone ou diminuer ça. Alors, c'est euh, les trois grands niveaux là, de, de notre analyse. J'ai juste une petite question parce que vous avez parlé des PME, puis euh, souvent, c'est la grande entreprise qui euh, fait de la divulgation. Euh, ils ont les moyens, ils ont des équipes souvent pour se faire. Comment, c'est comme, quoi la difficulté à la fois pour vous d'aller de, 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 chercher l'information, de convaincre, puis de convaincre les entreprises de, 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 de l'importance de, 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 de faire cette analyse-là pour leur propre compréhension de leurs risques ouais. de leurs occasions? C'est un excellent point parce qu'on voit avec le, la la montée là, de, 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 des normes de transparence, que c'est d'abord demandé aux grandes entreprises qui sont sur les marchés euh, boursiers et ensuite, celles-ci vont se tourner vers leurs fournisseurs pour leur demander l'information. Et euh, au Québec, on est une économie de PME, alors nous, on, on cherche à aider les petites entreprises qui ne qui, qui savent pas, qui ne l'ont pas, à trouver cette information-là et à la structurer. Euh, Déjà, le fait qu'on qu ait notre questionnaire est quelque chose de très utile et là, on a, on a pu voir des, de plus en plus de ces appels-là par des, des grandes entreprises qui demandent à leurs fournisseurs de fournir de l'information et là, on, on informe nos entreprises, hey, cette information-là, tu l'as déjà ramassée parce qu'elle est dans le diagnostic. On est en train aussi de travailler avec des firmes locales pour numériser tout ça et permettre la comparabilité, puis permettre la mise à jour fréquente également pour garder ça ouvert. Mais une des choses qui, qui incite les entreprises de plus en plus à, à ramasser cette information-là, à, la, à mieux la connaître, à mieux la gérer, c'est de voir les opportunités de marché que ça ouvre, d'être capable de dire « moi, j'offre un produit qui est plus vert, moi, j'offre un produit qui a un, un meilleur impact social euh, ». C'est maintenant de plus en plus dans les critères d'achat de différents joueurs, alors ça devient pertinent. Madame Labrie, c'est une entrée en matière parfaite. Je ne sais pas de quelle façon vous travaillez avec vos fournisseurs. C'est probablement une étape plus loin dans la maturité de l'entreprise que quand on travaille non seulement sur soi, mais aussi sur les entreprises de son écosystème. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire, dans notre cas, vous avez commencé tout à l'heure, vous l'avez touché rapidement sur l'évolution de Cogeco, mais où est-ce que vous en êtes dans votre parcours en termes de divulgation? Puis Qu'est-ce qui vous reste à faire selon vous? Est-ce qu'il faut encore que vous travaillez encore plus avec vos fournisseurs, par exemple? Ou euh, donc euh, je, je serais curieuse de vous entendre là-dessus. Oui, non, c'est une bonne question parce que, comme on dit, c'est une longue aventure et euh, on a fait beaucoup de progrès et on est rendu à un niveau aussi où on a des engagements qui sont très, très ambitieux aussi. 
si on regarde seulement nos engagements euh, de réduction de gaz à effet de serre, ils sont à trois niveaux. Euh, il y a les réductions liées à nos activités, à nous, directes, donc euh, réduction de 65 euh, d'ici 2030. On a un volet qui, sont reliés, euh, qui est relié euh, aux émissions de nos produits et aussi des déplacements de nos employés, réduction de, de 30 d'ici 2030. Et il y a le volet où on s'est engagé à avoir 50, 50 de nos fournisseurs qui établissent leur propre cible aussi, euh, basée sur la science pour limiter le réchauffement euh, de la planète à 1,5 degré. Donc, on travaille avec nos fournisseurs, on s'est engagé à le faire d'ici 2025. Euh, donc, euh, c'est donc important pour nous que l'écosystème contribue et on sait qu'en en termes, en tant que grande entreprise, on a un impact euh, direct. Euh, je dirais qu'aujourd'hui, euh, ce qu'on a fait aussi euh, comme geste concret, c'est transformer euh, nos ententes de crédit corporatif à terme rotatif pour y ajouter des facteurs de développement durable. Alors, on s'est engagé euh, à relier donc, le, le taux d'intérêt à deux objectifs. Un, relié directement à des réductions euh, annuelles, donc de, de réduction d'émissions, mais aussi un deuxième objectif est lié à l'inclusion numérique. En tant que fournisseur de services Internet, euh, on trouvait important d'intégrer aussi la notion d'inclusion numérique et donc celle-ci est reliée directement à des investissements qu'on fait dans des régions non desservies par l'Internet haute vitesse. Donc, euh, donc à chaque année, euh, donc le taux d'intérêt va être associé. Euh, donc, ici, si on fait des économies, nos économies vont aller dans des initiatives de développement durable. Si je parle spécifiquement de la divulgation, euh, donc évidemment, il y a tout le volet de la divulgation de notre stratégie EG en général, que ce soit par nos rapports annuels EG, euh, que ce soit par nos mises à jour qu'on fait auprès des investisseurs dans le cadre de nos, euh, la divulgation de nos résultats trimestriels. On fournit aussi des données beaucoup plus détaillées sur notre site web maintenant. Et l'année dernière, on a fait une étape, euh, un pas encore plus euh, en avant avec la divulgation de notre premier plan d'action climatique et notre premier rapport euh, TCFD. Donc, euh, donc euh, on a fait aussi donc, une divulgation beaucoup plus euh, granulaire et beaucoup plus spécifique reliée au changement climatique. Euh, sur le plan de la divulgation CDP, euh, on était fiers l'année dernière parce qu'on a euh, réussi à avoir un score A. C'est une liste prestigieuse et on a travaillé fort pour ça, euh, pour continuer à travailler sur la transparence euh, environnementale dans notre divulgation. Euh, nous étions une de seulement trois entreprises canadiennes à être sur la liste A. Donc, tout ça, c'est… <rire> Bridget est, est heureuse de nos progrès, mais il faut dire que c'est… On, 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 ce sont des progrès qu'on fait au fil, fil des ans. Ça prend du temps. Notre première cote, elle était D. Oui. Euh, si on regarde il y a 10, 10 ans, donc c'est vraiment du progrès. Puis on a une équipe formidable. J'ai une collègue ici, Elisabeth Alves, qui, qui, qui est ici dans la salle. Donc, c'est beaucoup de, 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 de travail et de détails. Et euh, les prochaines étapes pour nous, c'est vraiment tout ce qui est relié à l'exécution de nos plans, évidemment. Euh, et donc, l'alignement, le soutien de l'équipe de direction est, est extrêmement important. Oui. Évidemment, ben, il y a plein de défis parce que les cadres de référence sont tous différents. Oui, donc, euh, on, on est heureux de voir qu'il y a une intention de standardisation, davantage de standardisation. Euh, mais un défi pour nous, c'est le volume aussi. Il y a énormément de, de, de demandes euh, et les demandes sont de plus en plus complexes. Euh, à remplir la documentation. Donc, c'est une grande partie du travail de l'équipe de remplir euh, toute cette documentation-là pour euh, la divulgation. Oui. Le, le, ça peut être euh, effectivement extrêmement lourd pour les émetteurs de répondre à, aux questionnaires et aux réponses parce qu'ils demandent souvent sur le même sujet, ils peuvent te poser la question pas tout à fait de la même façon et c'est oui. pas exactement la même donnée. Absolutely. Um, turning to you, Maura, uh, um, Marianne was just telling us, you know, some of the challenges that companies face, but companies are not alone. There are industry associations that can work together and, and kind of uh, uh, surmount uh, collaboratively the, the data challenges. Um, 
I was curious if you could tell us a little bit more about this story about the life insurance industry and what, what it has done together to, to uh, both increase disclosure on, on environmental uh, risk, but also go beyond environmental and into the social risk, which are sometimes, uh, well, maybe less so than before, but a little less under or underreported and not as much uh, been the center of focus in the past years that maybe it should have been. Certainly. So maybe I'll back up a little bit and talk about collaboration and, and why you should even consider it. Um, so TD Insurance is part of the larger TD Bank group, and both the insurance company and the larger group are very involved in our industry associations and the UN Environment Program, um, programs on banking and the ones that I work on, which are the principles for sustainable insurance. And the way we see it is developing sources or identifying sources of data are not really competitive and developing together with industry frameworks for understanding and assessing and disclosing those risks are not competitive. What's competitive is how you use the data and how you use the frameworks to drive decision making. So considering how quickly everything is moving, as our colleagues have discussed, there is no way one company can figure all, out all of this together. And there is no way that us as individual companies within an industry can help move the industry forward fast enough unless we work together. So with the insurance company, we work with the um, Life and Health Association and the Property and Casualty Association um, in Canada and have leadership in those organizations to help move that along within Canada and also to help with the very important objective of standardization, of harmonization, so that we don't, we speak with one voice and can help drive um, a focus on getting the right thing done and not looking at the differences between standards. Um, so that's a very important objective of that aspect. At the UN level, we've been doing a number of really important projects. So one that was launched this June with the 10 year anniversary of the principles for sustainable insurance was an ESG guide to life and health underwriting. So investment risk is well understood in the insurance industry and physical risk is easier to understand. Yes. You see a fire, you understand the risk in intuitively, but understanding what aspects of how you price risk for life and health products very little work had been done. And there, there seemed to be a need to really accelerate the development of that work. And so we put together a working group led by one of the, the PSI companies and with support from the Secretariat to chunk out various aspects of the issue. And we decided that in six months, which is lightning speed for industry work, um, we were going to come together and put out this ESG guide for life and health underwriting, taking a matrix approach to addressing the risks and then a heat map approach so it could be easily understood and translated by individual businesses to their particular circumstances. You mentioned social issues. Within Canada, we're working on that as a priority, we got together with all of the principles for sustainable insurance members and we decided to work on four different work tracks within Canada, social issues being one of those because we felt, as you said, that very little work has been done on that. We're really going to first principles to figure out what it means for us in our Canadian context and our insurance context and then we'll be working to together collaboratively to figure out a work plan for how we want to approach social risks. It's great, fascinating. Um, going back to you, Mr. Lassie, um, I was just uh, 
we were hearing from the industry, from the companies, but governments who I think for some time let kind of let institutional investors do the work have been really more active in recent uh, uh, months or uh, uh, we've seen the uh, United States Securities and Exchange Commission uh, uh, draft a uh, new uh, regulation for uh, climate risk disclosure. We have the European Union taxonomy, which is really trying to d identify with clarity what is what is truly sustainable or not. If you're looking at the OECD countries as a whole, um, what, what should companies that are up active in this uh, in this these regions uh, be expecting in terms of change? What are the trends that you're seeing in terms of governments? kind of stepping up the the regulation to encourage disclosure? Uh, it's a very good question, Sophie, because uh, I think that the multinational companies must expect a more normative approaches from governments that uh, made uh, ambitious climate uh, commitments to reach net zero targets by 2050 in their NDCs and some of them in their um, uh, long-term strategies that they submitted to the UNFCCC. In general, governments are universalizing uh, environmental regulations, making them increasingly strict and more stringent. It is true that the current economic situation is delaying or could delay some policy decisions uh, on this regard, but in general, um, uh, I think that uh, the population is, is, is creating the momentum uh, for, for politicians, uh, for many policy uh, makers to really adopt uh, more ambitious uh, frameworks uh, in, 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 the, in this industry, in the, in the finance industry. At this phase of the acceptance of ESG in the global financial system, consistency and comparability uh, in ESG regimes are the two most important features to develop. Some of, of you are mentioning that. Uh, so while mandatory sustainability disclosure is not yet common, as some jurisdictions uh, at the OECD, uh, are, are, um, of nations are, are moving forward. Uh, UK is one of the most recent examples. Uh, in April, uh, they are requiring uh, over uh, 1,300 companies to disclose uh, climate-related financial risks uh, on a mandatory basis using guidelines from the Tax Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, this, this uh, uh, framework that started in 2017, if I remember well. Switzerland, it's another country, Switzerland plans to have new rules for large Swiss companies on disclosure non-financial matters, including environmental issues, uh, come into force uh, in January 2023 as uh, in, in the European Union. The European Union's uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive covering reporting by corporates, banks and insurers uh, was agreed recently. And the EU's sustainable finance, uh, finance uh, sorry, uh, disclosure regulation uh, covering reporting by asset managers uh, and institutional investors was agreed recently, and it requires reporting on sustainability risks and impacts associated with investment uh, portfolios. Uh, also, the International Sustainability Standards Board uh, uh, has put out uh, for consultation on draft sustainability standards. Uh, one deals with general sustainability related disclosure requirements, while the second addresses climate related disclosure. So, the UK is moving towards uh, making publication on transition plans mandatory for financial institutions, and there are many other uh, examples. The OECD is now developing, as I was telling you, the guidance uh, on transition finance which aims at uh, facilitating investment for a whole of economy transition while factoring uh, in different contexts. The, the guidance uh, focuses on the key elements that uh, should be included uh, in credible uh, corporate transition plans, because that is, the, that is the most important part. In doing so, the guidance can achieve the dual aim of uh, helping financial market uh, participants identify credible investment opportunities among corporates who are raising finance to implement uh, their transition plan uh, and support corporates in, in developing those plans and strategies to attract the financing necessary uh, to implement them. 
It can also help uh, policymakers identify policy changes to support the market participants in, in this area. So the OECD aims to publish the guidance uh, in the late September 2022. Uh, uh, because um, everything is moving very fast, uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, in, in, in the following two or three years we will see a big change uh, in, in this uh, uh, normative approach uh, from governments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, when we talk about environmental, and this is kind of a discussion I'd like to open for everybody, uh, whoever wants to jump in, but uh, when we talk about environmental reporting, a lot of people assume that we're talking about climate. And as Mrs. Rema uh, mentioned in the onset of our uh, discussion, it's, it's it's big. It's getting much more broader. We're talking about ma water management. We're talking about biodiversity. And maybe I, I'll just ask you, maybe Bridget, to, to kind of launch the conversation because your organization yourself has broadened beyond climate. How how does this help uh, companies manage their risks or industries manage their risks to to look at the environment in a much broader sense than just the uh, uh, although it's super important, but you know, in the narrow climate sense. Mm -hmm. I might start off just kind of linking the previous conversation in. I think that this kind of movement from, you know, voluntary to more mandatory, mandatory disclosure on the climate side, it's very important because it kind of produces this level playing field and introduces regulatory certainty. But organizations like CDP, we still have we see ourselves still having a critical role in continuing to push the boundaries in many of these other areas as well. So still in climate, um, expanding our work that already exists in um, freshwater deforestation across all planetary boundaries. So we're looking at oceans, we're looking at waste, we're looking at biodiversity. Um, but part of that, so a couple elements of this answer, um, that can be very, so we've already had some conversations about how time intensive and how detailed a lot of this reporting is. So that can be very terrifying to talk a lot about this, this expansion. But this expansion is critical because, um, and we, we could use, for instance, the agriculture sector as, as an example. Companies need to be disclosing against, companies or all stakeholders need to be disclosing against all of these themes, as we refer to them at CDP, that are relevant, to the extent that they are relevant to them. So we, as we look to expand to these planetary boundaries, are also looking to um, do some of this kind of double materiality assessment to determine what is most impactful for each individual type of sector. So if we look at food, for instance, um, in my in my role as I guess associate director of the impact CDP makes in the world in North America, I'm also responsible for our sustainable food systems program. And I did a practice of kind of evaluating the food companies that disclose to CDP and what what they need to be disclosing to. And food is one of those extremely interconnected across thematic areas where you cannot. You, can, you will not be successful in transitioning to a sustainable food system, for instance, by just looking at climate in silo. Um, you're also much more successful as a food company to be addressing multiple of these themes at once because usually the solution, so nature-based solutions as an example, is a win-win-win across the board and you're going to get most value in those, in those solutions. So we need to kind of come to this um, opportune kind of middle ground of helping companies to ad identify what is most relevant to them that they need to be kind of digging into in their own operations as well as in their supply chains, which you were speaking to earlier. If we're talking about food, all of the impact is in the supply chain as well, and it's incredibly dependent on, on nature to continue to operate. Um, so we need to be kind of finding this this zone where we can enable companies to be able to look at this ever expanding space and to narrow and hone in on what of those um, risks and opportunities and solutions are going to be the most beneficial that they can can implement. But it's it's not an easy task, I would say. No. It's it's tellement vrai comment tout ça est relié là. Tu sais, on regarde nous on fait quelques investissements, là, on est dans des, des groupes Finance for Biodiversity Pledge, Natural Capital Investment Alliance, qui cherchent à non seulement être carboneutes, mais positifs pour la nature. Puis, on, on voit, euh, font, par exemple, le fonds Urapi qui fait des pratiques d'agroforesterie durable en Amérique latine, mais 
ils le font au départ pour réduire la dégradation des terres, mais ça crée aussi, ça réduit les émissions de CO2 et ça améliore aussi les, les aspects sociaux dans, dans, dans le coin. Même chose avec le, le fonds Inlandsis qui, à la base, lui, est là pour les, les crédits carbone, donc pour financer des crédits carbone, mais qui vient de s'associer avec d'autres investisseurs pour protéger une réserve naturelle au Vermont qui va permettre de, créer, de générer des crédits compensatoires de carbone forestier et ça va préserver des forêts de feuillus et des, des ruisseaux. Alors, c'est c'est toutes, des, c toutes des, des choses qui sont reliées. La nature, l'eau, les, les ressources, le carbone. Euh, et c'est important, là, la notion de matérialité. Et sur quoi est-ce que ma compagnie ou mon groupe est capable d'agir? Je pense que c'est important que chacun vise à faire le maximum. On parle beaucoup euh, de la complexité et euh, l'entreprise pour laquelle je travaille aussi a composé avec plusieurs euh, cadres de divulgation, donc je, je sais exactement de quoi vous parlez. Euh, L'arrivée, euh, je vous dirais, de, de ISSB, le, dans la dernière année, c'est peut-être l'une des avancées les plus importantes, sinon de la dernière année, sinon au moins de la dernière décennie. On arrive enfin à avoir peut-être l'espoir d'avoir un cadre et un langage commun. Um, uh, with, with such a, with the ISSP, uh, Mr. Lassie, maybe you can pick this up or m maybe more. Uh, uh, do you think that this common language will have kind of a snowball effect and, and, and really kind of expand disclosure by making it maybe a little bit less daunting for, for companies that are a little bit overwhelmed by the number of frameworks and competing uh, systems that they need to report uh, in? Yes, the, the extent to which the environmental pillar of ESG ratings reflects uh, carbon emission reductions, efficient resource use and investment to support the renewables has become the important component of ESG investing and is critical to enable market uh, participants, of course, to make informed decisions relating to a low carbon transmission. Uh, but in, in the other hand, in recent years, international climate transition commitments and initiatives have expanded to provide a structured approach to assess the uh, climate transition plans and pathways toward net zero. And now, as, as we hear here, Uh, we are trying to incorporate uh, this concept of nature-based solutions that can, of course, reduce greenhouse gases and also protect biodiversity assets. So we believe that the, the assessment of climate uh, transition frameworks uh, and their alignment with the environmental pillar of ESG ratings can improve market efficiency. Uh, while important progress has been made to improve uh, sustainability tools and investing approaches, uh, including through the environmental pillar of ESG rating, methodologies will need to move from rewarding disclosure to rewarding alignment of company activities with sustainability, uh, biodiversity and climate resilience uh, 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 commitments and, and programs. So I think that th there is a normal, uh, natural, progressive uh, alignment that, uh, of course, the uh, governments are expecting because uh, Uh, we are, uh, uh, from the private sector, uh, waiting for the trillions that we need to uh, massively deploy technologies uh, to protect the planet in general, to, to, to address these uh, three climate or uh, environmental crises, no? climate change, biodiversity lost, and, and the pollution of uh, almost all kind of ecosystems. Maybe Moira, you want to add something on the ISSB because it's really been a kind of a, a milestone in terms of uh, helping companies and, and also in, in investors and all the stakeholders in the ecosystem really have better comparability and disclosure. Definitely. So maybe I'll pick up on the comment. I love the phrase, the progression towards alignment. <laughs> I think that's really important for companies. When you have a number of different standards at the international level, and then standards at the national level, and then also at the regional level, companies end up spending all their time looking at the intersections of those standards and focusing on what's different about them and not what those standards are post supposed to achieve and how they're supposed to drive decision-making and making better decisions, both for your company um, and for all of us. So that 
alignment, I think, is absolutely critical, and that will help us move forward from this deer in the headlights situation where we don't know where what's going to come at us next and how we are going to be expected to focus to actually moving forward to something that is going to be useful for decision making internally and externally. Yeah, I mean, the purpose is not to report, the purpose is to progress, right? Yes, <laughs> and sometimes that gets lost. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, it's a testament to a good panel when I, my, I still have tons of questions and we're running out of time. So, uh, so the last three minutes, I was thinking maybe I'd just go quickly around and maybe uh, ask you to, to say what, what in one sentence or a couple of sentences, what, what should we be looking for in terms of evolution of disclosure? Maybe Madame Labri, uh, what, what is the key word or the key takeaway you're taking from this discussion? Je dirais deux choses. Euh, avec les cibles ambitieuses que les entreprises ont annoncées, euh, l'emphase doit être mise sur l'exécution. Donc, il y a beaucoup de travail, beaucoup de défis. Il faut automatiser aussi les données. Il faut savoir comment collecter toutes ces données-là et s'assurer d'un suivi de très près. Il y a énormément de défis avec l'environnement actuel, l'accès aux véhicules électriques dans le cadre de l'électrification de notre, nos flottes. Euh, donc, euh, ça demeure donc euh, extrêmement... Euh, ça demande une approche très rigoureuse pour s'assurer qu'on rencontre les cibles. Donc, je pense que je reprendrai un mot de Moira, collaboration. We need to work together. Uh, private sector, governments, all levels of governments, civil society, so that we can achieve our objectives. I would build off a word that I haven't said enough in this, that, but I have heard, and that is transition. Um, disclose, we've, we've talked about why we need information to be able to do anything, but the disclosure mechanism, for instance, the one that CDP runs, it's the point of that mechanism is to drive change. And that change that we are trying to drive towards is the sustainable transition journey. So moving forward, our focus is very much to um, be introducing these forward-looking metrics. So it is more of an assessment of how well are we doing towards that transition. But critical to be able to do that is to have what those North Stars are. So we ha we've had those for, we've had some of those for climate in the TCFD as well as the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And we are now seeing those coming very soon down the line with the TNFD as well as the Science-Based Targets for Nature. And I feel like all of those tools together, so having those North Star, having these credible transition plans that we can now look more towards assessing companies against their progress towards that transition versus solely, you know, disclosure, I think is really the, is the, at least the direction that we're very much pushing our strategy towards, and I think is kind of the next frontier for disclosure as well. Madame I? Moi, je voudrais attirer l'attention sur l'opportunité que ça représente pour les entreprises qui font les bonnes choses. Alors maintenant, le, le, le terrain est, est, est plus égal et euh, ce que vous faites déjà de bon peut être mis de l'avant et vous offre maintenant des nouvelles opportunités, des nouveaux marchés, des nouvelles possibilités de, de vendre à des, à des grands clients. Et je pense que c'est super important parce que la divulgation, on ne fait pas ça pour divulguer, on fait ça pour que les gens fassent de plus en plus les bonnes choses. Mm. Merveilleux. Moira? So I'll take the concept of collaboration and I'll break that down to what I think is most important. And that is honestly listening and understanding each other so that we can work together to create frameworks, opportunities to, to break down par uh, barriers and solve problems. Le mot de la fin, Monsieur Lassie, you've got the final word. Well, perhaps a standardization and an improvement of the ESG ratings because uh, it's a building block for the implementation of Article 6 of Paris Agreement. We need to create this system of systems uh, for carbon pricing, for the carbon markets, and all the financial uh, instruments that must be aligned, but also must be synchronized with the uh, objective of, uh, of the Paris Agreement. So for me, standardization and improvement uh, are important. Melvin, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all of our uh, 
guests for listening to our conversation. I think uh, we have a closing uh, remark that's going to be uh, done by our MC.